to the message this morning. The title of the message is At the King's Table. Someone say, At the King's Table. This is such a portrayal of grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that it will speak to you about you, but I also pray that it will speak to you about some Body else. I'm going to turn to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 4. Later we'll journey into chapter 9. But 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan that they had died came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and ran. And it happened as she made haste to flee that she dropped him. He fell and he became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Everyone say, I'll never forget Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Say it again, Mephibosheth. Now spell it. No, just kidding. <laughs> I can spell it for you because I've studied that name too long, but I um, also want to read from Psalms 139, um, a familiar passage. 139 verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit, O Lord? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are right there too. Surely you are with me. The darkness and the light are both alike from you. Can you say amen? Father, we thank you for this worship. We thank you for the ministry time. We thank you for what you've already said and accomplished. But we welcome you, Holy Spirit. Speak to us. Speak to me. Come, Holy Spirit, and do what you do best and make alive the word. Whisper into my brother and sister's ears even what I don't church. Strengthen us as individuals. Strengthen us as families. And let us, Lord, be commissioned once again to sit at the king's table. Everyone said amen. At the king's table, a portrayal of true grace. Grace is unmerited. Someone say unmerited. Favor. It's an old Hebrew term, which means to bend down or to stoop, to bend over. One theologian said, love that goes upward is worship. Love that goes outward is affection. But love that stoops down and lifts up someone lower than them is grace. It's truly amazing. Can you say amen? Today we see a grace awakening happening in 2 Samuel. And I pray it will happen for you and I. Let us travel back. 3,000 or more years to the days of ancient dynasties, a brutal area. When one king went in to take the kingdom, all the family, all the wives, all the children were killed of the former dynasty. So you can imagine the fear that hit families as they learned a new king had come to take over the palace. Once the new king took over, there was panic and pandemonium. And there was a little boy who was five years old named Mephibosheth. Say his name. He was five years old when the report came of Saul and Jonathan's death, which was his father and his grandfather. A nurse picked him up, and she ran trying to get out of the palace before the swordsman could come and kill all the children. It wasn't a time to be alive as a king's son in those days. And it happened in her haste to leave to get out of the palace. She dropped him and he became lame. When she picked him up, his feet were crippled. He was dropped, no fault of his own. Maybe you've been there. Can I get an amen? Maybe someone dropped you. Maybe a failure in your life dropped you and you felt you became lame and you would stay crippled in your heart the rest of your life. But I have good news. Jesus Christ wants to heal, restore, and mend. Someone say hallelujah this morning. Maybe it was a circumstance that dropped you. Maybe it was an attack that came against you. Maybe it was a heartbreak. Maybe it was a decision you made and you dropped your own self. Anybody but me been there before? You dropped yourself. You got involved in some things. As we say, you dropped the ball. Thanks be to God that you and I don't have to live in a place of Lodabar that we'll find out in a moment, but that Jesus Christ comes to pick us up and redeem us to dignity. Someone give Jesus a hand clap of praise this morning. Come on, let him hear it. Thank you, Jesus. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul? that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. That's important. Everyone say, Jonathan's sake. And there was a servant of the house of Saul 
Listen to the no in the voice of this servant, whose name was Ziba. And so when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, I am. I'm at your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to who I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan, but he is lame in both of his feet. And the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said, he is in the house of Mekar, the son of Amal, in Lodabar, and he lives there. Look at someone and say, Lodabar. Reason this is so important, because Lodabar was the town of forgotten people. It's where the uneducated and the unskilled and the outcasts, the black sheep and the misfits. Am I talking to anybody today? Aren't you glad Jesus has raised us all out from being a misfit? Come on, somebody. Give Jesus a shout of praise this morning. Those who believed their lives were over, those who were living in Lodabar. Everyone say Lodabar. Lodabar meant a place that was barren, a place where nothing was happening. If I were a non-spiritual spin doctor or a present-day political commentator, I might say about those living in Lodabar, just settle down. You know what? Just make peace with your crippled self. Just make peace with your hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Just make peace and continue to live in Lodabar, in a second-class citizen community, because that's all you were ever made to be. That's what the unspiritual or the religious would say. Can I get an Amen. Things will never get better. Anybody ever heard your own mind tell you things will never get better? He was so young, he couldn't remember the days of royalty. He was five when he was dropped. I'm sure his nurse that stayed with him never told him about the palace because she was probably afraid if he knew what was really inside of him, he would be so unsettled he might take his own life. You see, Mephibosheth could have built a memorial to days gone by instead of holding out joy and hope for tomorrow. But I believe like you and I, when we're in a season of Lodabar, when we're in a season where it seems like nothing is happening, can I get and amen a season that we can't see greatness I believe that God himself sings to the seed that's inside of us that's because you didn't give up because God was telling you in the season of Lodabar there is more to you than you know you just don't know it right now come on somebody give Jesus a hand that seed of greatness was buried in there David said, I love the Lord because I cried unto him and he took me up out of a pit. He put my feet on the rock. He put a new song into my mouth, Psalms 40. And many shall see and shall fear the name of the Lord. I love the Lord because when I cried out to him in Lodabar, when nobody gave this once divorced single scarlet letter on her woman years ago at Lee College, there was a seed of greatness that God kept singing to me I couldn't figure it out I didn't know how it would look like but I'm encouraging every man and woman in this room don't let the doubters and the fruit stealers and those that sing to you the mournful songs cause you to make a place in Lodabar when God has called you to the royal table of the king come on somebody give him a shout of praise this morning there had to be an awakening of grace in Mephibosheth's, Mephibosheth's life. <laughs> See if I can slaughter his name. It had to be awakened. I'm sure hope spring up. You ever had hope to spring up like a fire only to be extinguished by others or by a situation? You think it's better, but no. But here's the cool thing. All the time Mephibosheth is living in Lodabar, a barren place, a forgotten place, a place where you don't feel like anything good is happening. God was orchestrating a plan. God was coordinating an idea that was going to make an itinerary that God had planned make a travel agent look like she was just lame. Come on, somebody. You see, there can be seasons where you think this is going nowhere. There can be seasons where you think nothing is happening. But what you don't know is all the time. I heard Bishop Jake say when I was a young preacher, God is the quietest right before he moves in on the scene. Come on. Raising my baby girls, I knew everything was fine 
Leela when they were loud, but when they got quiet, God saved the queen. Come on, somebody. They were either decorating the walls or flushing seashells down the front toilet to the bottom toilet. Come on, somebody. I knew when they were quiet, they were up to something. I love it about God, Amanda, that when I think he's quiet, he is merely moving the chess pieces of this game called life. He is coordinating the next great step for you. Your best days are not over. The Lord God himself is working in your behalf. Somebody give him a shout of praise. God was mindful of Mephibosheth. Maybe others didn't know where Lodabar was. <laughs> I remember many seasons of my life where I wasn't even sure God knew where I was. Can I get a witness? Forgotten, overwhelmed. We each have our own past. We each have our own weaknesses. We each have things that we go through. And you wondered if even God knew where your Lodabar was, your barren place. But I love that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And God always looks into Lodabar. He saw the possible plan for the greatness of Mephibosheth. I submit to you today, this morning, that like Mephibosheth, we experience the same thing. Seasons of no change. Can I get an amen? Seasons of prayer, but no fruit to the prayers, it seems. Seasons of Lodabar living. And I think the worst thing I can submit to you, it can encourage you, but it's the worst thing. Sometimes we judge where God has called us as Lodabar, and God calls it a palace. Come on, somebody. We're the janitor, but we think we should be the president. Can I get an amen? I tell you, my husband's grandfather was a famous janitor in Southern California, Garland Davis Creek Indian chief. Look, and when he walked, you got out of his way because he looked like a chief Indian. Loved him so much. But he served in Southern California high schools as a janitor. And they would say, Mr. Garland, you could be the president. You could be the principal. He said, but God called called me to be the janitor because as I'm cleaning up the trash and the junk in this place, I'm also encouraging the young people that whatever trash they have in their life, that Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, can heal them. Somebody give the Lord praise. You and I better be careful what we call Lodabar. An elder said to me recently, especially us in ministry, one of the biggest sins we do is to seize the sin of presumption presuming what this is going to be what we do or this is what we're going to do. And he said, the greatest thing to do is to ask God, where have you called me? And then make that place the most awesome place in the world. We don't understand why we'd get called to Eaton or we'd get called to Whirlpool or some of these other places or to the radio station. But we better be careful that we don't label a Lodabar. There is Lodabar seasons. There's seasons that we feel forgotten and overlooked. But there's also seasons that the Lord, I feel like, whispers and says, you know what, if I was going to blog about you today, if I was going to write a, a Facebook post, about you, Dave. If I was going to tweet about you, if I was going to IG about you, if I was going to Snapchat, I don't do that Snapchat craziness. But anyway, if I was going to do all of that, if I did it, you'd be surprised at what I'd say about you. It's not the days you thought you stormed the gates with 12,000 people behind you, but it was the days that you showed up and you were faithful and did not call your season Lodabar when you knew I had placed you in that place that you would be my light. Someone give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Be careful not to call Lodabar barren what well, maybe is not barren, but it's anointed by God. I've told you the fruitfulness, and I won't go back into all the secular jobs I've worked in my life. I've been a children's pastor. I've done so much in my life, most of it secular, working at insurances, restaurants, waitressing, serving, all of that. But when I look back on my life, I sometimes feel like those moments the Lord may be the most pleased with. Don't call Lodabar what's not Lodabar. Look at your neighbor and say, don't do it. And here we are, the years had passed, and King David is ruling and reigning. He's being blessed by God. This is where you come in, King David. He's being blessed by God, enjoying success and wealth and acclaim. In chapter 8, right before chapter 9, he conquers 17,000 Syrians. He is enjoying a time of prosperity and peace and victory. He has made a name for himself. He's at the top of his game. He's doing everything that God had called him to do, which caused him to pen Psalms 139. David is living 2 Corinthians 1 and 20. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. The Lord is living, or David is living, 
living. Psalms 84 and 11. The Lord God is a sun and shield. He gives grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Amen. He's living James 1 and 17. Every perfect and good gift comes down from the Father who does not change like shifting shadows. And in this moment of success, in this moment of victory, let me make it plain. In this moment of 13 months clean from cocaine, in this moment of I'm paying my bills for the first time, in this moment of my kids are serving the Lord, in this moment of I've got a job and a house and a car, come on somebody, in this moment of I found my other person, in this moment of whatever that looks like, he could have sat on his laurels, as my grandmother used to say. He could have sat there and just enjoyed it and so can you and so can I or we can ask the Lord who have we forgotten in Lodabar who is living beneath dignity while I am enjoying this who I ask myself is homeless today as our great pastor was given a phenomenal dream last summer pastor Hank about the homeless I can't retell it but we've been talking about that the elders and I what the Lord is going to lead that to be like because God was just throwing his grace on pastor Hank for the homeless he never forgot who he was who have we forgotten who have you forgotten while we're enjoying paying all these bills and David said is there anyone left I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake let me tell you something today let me get right out of the gate and it was not a long message but let me tell you and it's going to end with an illustration but let me tell you I'm to ask my father God today for Jesus' sake who have I left in Lodabar who have I forgotten who have I overlooked is it the girl at Zaxby's is it the guy at the gas station is it the person at Baskin Robbins do I work with him is it someone I used to reach out to this weekend I've been reaching out to prodigals that have gotten misaligned since Pastor Hank went to heaven and I've been so seeking them out I've been telling them you got to get back this is the time to come back to the king's table come on somebody come on somebody and we should be asking father who for Jesus' sake do I need to remember you know David asks us this is a question of grace asked by a grateful man is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I can show kindness that word is kesed in the Hebrew it means mercy loving kindness grace I love the question for what it does not ask everyone say for what it does not ask he doesn't say is there anyone deserving to come sit at this table is there anyone who is qualified is there someone that has a five-star review on the internet? Is there someone who's smart and incredibly perfect that I can add to my government, my life? I'm looking for the richest and the best. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? No, Jesus looked for the misfit. Jesus looked for the adulterer. Jesus looked for the addict. Jesus looked for the woman and the man caught in fornication. Jesus looked for the Pharisee. Jesus looked for the tax collector. We got to get back to looking to the broken and the lost and the misfits. Come on, somebody. Come on, give Jesus a hand. I love it for what it doesn't ask. It doesn't ask any of that. It just simply asks, is there anyone? Unconditional desire, a question dripping with grace. Dripping with grace. Is there anybody out there I can show kindness to? The servant, Ziba, I've already read his words, but track with me. He said, yeah, there's somebody. He's crippled. He isn't kingly. He doesn't fit in. That's what he said. He goes, yeah, there's one, but he's not like the rest of us. I love Keith David's response rather than, well, how crippled is he? You ever said that to somebody? I mean, how crazy are they before I help them, you know? I mean, if they killed anybody, you know, um, how crazy are they? How long have they had this addiction before I get involved? One thing I loved about my husband, he never asked how long someone had been in addiction. It didn't scare him. It didn't make him afraid. Other people say, oh, everybody's tried to help him. Well, everybody's tried to help her. Well, you know what? There's an appointed day on God's itinerary when that breakthrough is going to come. I don't care if a thousand people before me have reached out to somebody. It does not stop me receiving and giving grace someone give Jesus a shout of praise but I love that King David doesn't say how how bad is he crippled he didn't say can I get his references how about a good resume from 17 pastors that have tried to help him before me 
Let me take a moment to search his internet history. Come on. Let me just see if there's anything out there on the internet about him. Wow. (laughs) David responds with, where is he? Where is he? Where is this one? If there's anybody, if there's somebody, let's get him in here. I want to ask you this morning again, King David's blessed of God. Is there someone you need to be reminded of that's living in Lodabar? Is it time to pick up that phone again, send that Facebook message? I reached out this morning to some graduates of this weekend, to graduates of Hope House. Some are here. I just I know they love to come to special things like this, but also to those of not darkened church in days. And they're like, oh, pastor, I'm too far gone. I said, you are never too far gone. Come on. You are never too far gone. Well, what will people say if I walk in? They're going to say nothing but welcome. Good to see you this morning. I said, because that's who we are, the tribe of the whosoever. Amen. Amen. But he says he's living in Lodabar, a barren place, a place where there's no nothing going on. You and I, and Josh, come help me. I'm not quite done. Please, nobody leave. I, this, we've got something very important to do here. But Josh, if you'll come and start helping me. But he was living in Lodabar, a barren place, in Habakkuk 3 and 17. What's funny about Lodabar, Michael Cook, is that Lodabar was known a place where nothing would grow and nothing would happen. And there are seasons in my life that I submit to. You know, I'm, I'm not here to do that, but when I'm training young ministers, I'm always telling them. I just told a group of leaders this about last Sunday morning. I'll tell you all about it last time, but what God did at like midnight that night and how he brought me through. But I love to share that because I don't think you are at all encouraged by my strengths, but I think you are encouraged by my weaknesses. Because if you start to view everybody that it's just magic, abracadabra, and things are just so easy for everybody, then when you hit a hard place, you're going to want to run. Come on, somebody. But when we're honest, and it said, Habakkuk said, though the fig tree fails to blossom, Habakkuk 3 and 17, Yet I will rejoice in God, my Savior. Why did Habakkuk say that? Why am I bringing that up about Lodabar? Because even in a barren place, I'm going to rejoice. Even when I can't see anything happen, I'm going to praise him. Because I know my God is too great of a divine orchestrator that he's got something wonderful happening. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I love that David had a yes face. I want a yes face. So many people refer to Pastor Hank as Jesus with skin on. I mean, our exterminator, he says to me the other day, he's just a cool guy, long hair. I, I love guys with long hair. I'm like for the, I was talking to Kelly Gowans yesterday about a thing he went to, and he was just sharing how worship here had charted his life. And I love, we were talking about the days of the long hairs when we came here to church, and men had longer hair than me. It was beautiful anyway. Um, but I, I love that David had a yes face. I love that he had that yes. Pastor Hank had a yes face. And our exterminator, now I got back where I was with the long hair. Thank you, Lord. Anyway, he says to me the other day, because he helps here and he helps at my house, and he said, you know, he goes, you know one thing about Hank? And he's a Kellen's just cool. I mean, former ball player, long hair. I'll have to set y'all, some of y'all up with him. But he was a young man. And I said, what did you love so much about him? He goes, I'm telling you, he could talk everything. He'd be talking to you about rock music. Then the next thing he'd be talking about a sports team. And the next thing he'd be talking about some cool thing he saw. And he goes, my God, the first six months, I didn't even know he was a preacher. He said, he's talking to me about everything. He was my very favorite customer in seven counties. I said, no doubt. He said, but there's this thing. And I said, what's the thing, Kellen? He said, at the end, he'd hook you. He'd come out of nowhere. And he'd start telling his story about how he'd been redeemed from cocaine for almost 40 years. Come on, somebody. He'd start telling his story, and he tell, he said, he told me so much about you and him, I got sick of hearing it. I said, I know. I love that about him. The Holy Spirit reminds me all the time that it was his favorite story. He said, I love him. He goes, because I ain't never, is what Kellen said, met a preacher like that. He said, he was just cool. Big old truck. He'd get his KZ-106, you know, playing. I said, and the next thing, he'd have Daystar singers on. You never knew. He goes, I know. That's what I loved about him. I love that Pastor Hank had a yes. I want to be someone that has more of a yes face. Are you with me? I want to be because in Ziba's face, you hear a no. But in David, you hear a yes. I don't care how crippled he is. Ziba says, well, he has a, he's still crippled. He lives here. I know, but I don't think you want him to come. In 1807, there was a swollen river, and there was a group of men crossing in horseback, and they were fighting for their life. I mean, the bridge was going out. Death was imminent. 
And there was a few people on foot that came across trying to cross with this, this seeing these group of men on horseback. And this one man knew he was going to die. He didn't have horseback. And he went to one man on the horseback and he said, is there any way you can ferry me? I'm not going to make it. He said, absolutely, son, get on. When they crossed over, the men with the man that he got on the horse with said, why did you ask him? Why did you ask him? Do you not know who he is? He said, no. He said, that's President Jefferson, the president of the United States of America. He said, I didn't know that, but this is the powerful statement. This is in one of the biographies about the president. It said, he said, all I knew is all of you had no on your faces. When I looked at him, I saw a yes. I want to be that person with that yes, don't you? Say, help me, Jesus. <laughs> help me, Jesus. Jesus had a yes face. He was surrounded by Pharisees and scribes and people that were pious and knew more than anybody else, but he had a continual yes face. In fact, John said in the book of John, we beheld his glory. It was something different about him. We beheld his glory. It was the glory of the very presence of God Almighty. That was the yes. There was not a hesitation in David's voice. Servant Ziba, yeah, he lives in Lodabar. You don't want him. But David's words, follow me now, must have stunned Mephibosheth. When grace is in your heart like David, and I hope it's in your heart and mine, your hope is to release others from fears, not to create it. Come on. If I'm looking to create fear and judgment in you, I am not walking in the kingdom of Christ. I'm coming to release you from fear so you don't get into judgment. Amen. You see, what he was saying is, I've got good in mind for you. I want to lift you up. I want to show you kindness. Mephibosheth's heart must have melted with fear because he thought, and track with me, this is for someone in your life and maybe for you, he thought King David was seeking him because he wanted to punish him. David wasn't seeking him to punish him. David was seeking him to bless him. Come on. Sometimes we make prodigals feel like God's after you. He's going to get you. He's going to get you. He's going to get you. He's going to chase you down with a bat in his hand. Who wants to come home to that? But when we say the father has his arms wide open, you are welcomed at the king's table. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. My dear Maggie Woods, when she was working seven states, some of you have heard her testimony, my spiritual daughter, who was a preacher for me, but I didn't know it was in such active addiction. She was working seven states, felonies in seven states. And you have to hear that whole journey and how Pastor Hank and I drove her, got the bounty hunters off her house so we could get her children to school. Doesn't matter what all we did. We did it for the kingdom. But in the middle of her active addiction, she had a dream where I showed up in the middle of the dream. We've studied dreams in the summer. Some of you have heard it. And all of a sudden, I was, I was standing behind a pulpit and I was calling out words of knowledge. And she ran down and her hands were beaten which was beaten because she had been in the dealings of man. But she thought, Pastor Rhonda has shown up in the middle of my Lodabar, in the middle of my seven state felonies and just living such a horrible life. She's shown up to punish me. But the words that came out of my mouth was, Maggie, God knows you're here and he's welcoming you home. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. That's the God that you and I serve. Give him one more praise this morning. Who do you know still living in Lodabar? Who do you know? In 2 Samuel 9, let me read these verses to you before we journey on to our ending. So David said to him, So when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, fell on his face before King David, when he was taken to the palace, he had no option. The chariot came and got him and took him there. He was afraid. And he said, here is your servant. And David said to him, do not fear. Do you know how many times Jesus says, do not fear? 366 times. Come on, somebody. Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. I will restore to you all the land that's been given to you. And Mephibosheth bowed himself down, verse 8, and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as me? You see, he had been living in anonymity. He didn't want to be discovered. And he uses the most despicable verbiage that he can. I'm just a dead dog. I've been there before. I remember making it to an altar when I felt like a dead dog. Anybody with me? I remember when I felt worthless and hopeless about my life. Outclassed, outmarked, underrated. 
But before me and before you stood King Jesus vicariously through somebody that said, you are welcomed home. You are loved. You are accepted. You are forgiven. Someone give Jesus a shout of praise in this house. 1 John 4 and 8 says, perfect love casteth out all fear. If we are afraid, the living Bible says, we are not fully convinced that he loves us. To show grace is to extend favor and kindness. We say it can't be free. Grace is free. Look at your neighbor and say grace is free. No benefit to the kingdom, follow me, but due to a relationship, uninterrupted provision for Mephibosheth, undeserving love for him, unconditional love. I'm going to tell you something. When you are in Lodabar and you ascribe to God and you make him out of your own image, you are you are doing one of the Ten Commandments. When you ascribe to God the way you are, you have made God in your own image. God is not like you. He's incapable of some things. Can I get an amen? When you are mean and forgiving, He is good and merciful. When you are unpredictable and untrustworthy, He is predictable and He's trustworthy. He is steadfast and reliable. Someone say hallelujah. When your approval is based on conditions around you, He is full of unconditional grace. When you are absolutely where you are not supposed to be and places you're not supposed to be, He is present and available. Someone give King Jesus a hand clap of praise one more time. Come on. Verse 13 says, From that day on, Mephibosheth regularly sat at the king's table let me do this and I'll come back so you can just imagine the dinner bell rings at the palace you can just imagine as the dinner bell rings King David comes in so powerfully he sits down at the head beautiful warrior King David at the other end Bathsheba beautiful Bathsheba who's been redeemed and is now a wonderful virtuous woman someone say thank you for grace Jesus beautiful Tamar the king's daughter comes and sits down so beautiful Solomon the heir apparent to the throne in all his glory and wisdom his name was Jedediah because God wanted him to know that from an unholy alliance, God brought a holy thing, and now he was loved by the Lord. You can imagine as they all sit down, and all of a sudden, you hear coming from the side this clump, clump. You hear this shuffling of feet. He's a little bit late, like you and I often too, to the grace table. But here comes Mephibosheth, and as he sits down, he probably looks to the right and sees Bathsheba. He sees King David. Maybe Joab the warrior are there. I believe when the tablecloth hit his lame feet, he knew what grace felt like. And I believe you and I, when we sit at the king's table, and that tablecloth covers our feet that are lame and crippled from life's experiences, it is then that we will say, it is grace that has brought me this far, and it will be grace that will lead me home. Someone praise Jesus. This morning you were called to the king's table There was a young man who grew up at this church He chose to run from God He found himself in jail in Jail <laughs> jail in jail He found himself in jail for public drunkenness The pastor of this church, Pastor Hank Davis Went over and somehow talked the sheriff and the judge Into releasing him And the charge was removed Give Jesus a hand clap for that But this young man kept running from God's call. More than 20 years, he followed the world, thought the world had what he needed, drugs, alcohol, many failed relationships. But in January 2016, he had had enough of the world, and he ran long enough from God, so he ran then straight into the open arms of God Almighty, and he's been nestled ever since then. Please welcome Michael Brown to the king's table. Come on. Come on, please welcome Michael Brown to the King's Table. Hallelujah. Pastor Hank didn't know he was getting his own future son-in-law out of prison. Come on, somebody. You can't make this stuff up. I love it so much. (laughs) I love it so much. There was a woman 
who didn't feel welcomed at church. Church? People say, you should go to church. I can't go to church. I tried that. They didn't welcome me. They said I wasn't good enough, didn't fit in. So she didn't do it. And about three to four years ago, a friend of hers invited her to this church called Harvest on Easter. I ain't going to church on Easter. No, I promise you, you're going to be welcomed and loved here. You've never met a church like this church. So she came on that Easter morning, I think of 2019. She found her family here. Come on, somebody. She used to party all the time and drink to solve her problems. And I know this to be true because I'm part of her prayer group. Now she's texting and messaging us telling us praise reports and asking us to pray for her instead of turning to drink and she's turning to her church of the family her church of hearts family please welcome tina atkins to the king's table didn't hug you son <laughs> she was depressed to the point of suicide Homeless, turned to meth, to numb and try to get rid of her pain. Living homeless, living at the end of her rope. But today, she has a roof over her head. She has a house. She's transported in a beautiful vehicle. She's fed beautiful food and wonderful food three times a day. She goes to several different churches. This would be what we'd call her home church. She defeated her depression with praise. She found that her strength, not through meth anymore, but on her knees praying. Today, she is a resident and clean for several months at the Women of Hope. Please welcome Paula Brown to the King's Table. Come on, Paula. Come on, Paula. Beautiful of you. He was 23 years old, a newlywed found himself in the middle of a huge child custody fight and a baby toddler with his new wife. He was financially crippled, barely making ends meet, and then he lost his job. He felt like a failure as a husband. He felt like a failure as a father. But one day alone at his house, he fell on his face to God. He cried out to God and God met him that day and changed his life. And today, he's beaten the kingdom of hell through his drums. Please welcome Tanner Carson to the king's table. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone give Jesus praise. Beautiful testimonies. Amen. Just give Jesus praise for all of them because you didn't know where I was going with the first one. This is a table of redemption. This is what harvest has always looked like. In the beginning days, the Lord told Pastor Hank and I, if you will take those that nobody wants, they will soon become the ones that everybody wants. If you will not reach out your hand to the religious and the scribe, but you will reach out to the misfit, the addict, the wounded minister, the children of pastors that have forgotten who they were, and you'll welcome them to the king's table. I, the Lord, and I've seen this over and over again for 30 years, will raise them up to be mighty women and men of valor. Someone give Jesus a praise. Hallelujah. Come on, praise him in this house. I'm going to sit down with them because someday, Revelation 19 says, you and I will sit at the ultimate king's table. It's called the marriage supper of the lamb. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude saying, salvation and glory and honor to the lamb of God and to our king. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and we have made ourselves ready. Then he said to me, blessed are those who are called. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Someday we will sit. And as we sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb, of course, that table would go on and on. I don't know if you've ever seen an image. It's just 
Everyone that's ever lived that accepted Jesus, that is the clue, except Jesus is at that table. We're going to sit there and have my Tina, my Paula, my Tanner, my Michael, but also sitting there with us will be missionaries who gave their lives unknown to the world for the kingdom of Jesus, for the underground church. There will be martyrs that gave their lives in foreign countries and maybe even America, but they gave their life when they said, we're going to kill you. You either deny them and they killed them over and over again. Millions of them will be sitting at that long table. There'll be the disciples who were crucified and beaten sitting at that table. People like Abraham and Esther and all of that. And when I think about that and I look down that long table without us being changed, you have to wonder, am I worthy to sit here? But then all of a sudden, someone says, can I serve you a drink? Would you like a drink? And when I look to my right hand, there's one who has scars in his hand with a towel over his arm. And it is a lamb of glory serving all the inhabitants of the earth who he has redeemed by his own blood for the sake of Jesus Christ. I will be worthy to sit there when that tablecloth hits what is no longer crippled. Feet that have been redeemed. I will say, you are worthy of it all, Jesus. So today I commission you before I have you stand and pray, but right where you're seated, I ask you, who have we forgotten in Lodabar? Who can we show mercy to? Meshibbeth Mephibosheth ate at the king's table for the rest of his life regularly. If in our mind we're sitting somewhere lower than this, if our mind we're thinking somehow we're not worthy, we're just dead dogs, or maybe we've camped out in a mental place of Lodabar and ascribed to something the perception that it's not quite what we wish it was, and God said this is holy. Who do you need the Lord to speak to you, and what do you need him to speak about you? today if you'd stand if y'all would just stay here and pray from here if you'd stand all over this room right where you are I want to pray over you and then I want you to pray with each other I want to ask you today have you are you are you mentally living in Lodabar when you're really not in Lodabar are you believing the lies of the enemy that your life is not what it should be or can be are are you ascribing a season in your life that's not Lodabar is blessed and fruitful or are you sitting beneath that place of dignity are you partaking in things that should not be and dabbling in things that should not be and the king is saying my arms are open wide come to me I will help you I will strengthen you I'm not seeking you to punish you I'm not seeking you to destroy you I'm seeking you to heal you and then who today do you need to ask the Lord to help you that's living in Lodabar, a place beneath dignity. If you just close your eyes, I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for those listening by podcast. I thank you for those in this room most of all. Spirit of the Lord, for those that have ascribed a season as Lodabar, a barren place when it's not. Lord, let us watch the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart. Lord, let us not despise places you've put us for your glory, Jesus. Let us know that where you have called us, it, uh, being a janitor is greater than living in a palace if that's where you've called us. Lord, don't let us ascribe to our personal self that we are a dead dog or lower than a dog like Mephibosheth because of where we've been living and what we've been involved in. Let us remove that verbiage from our mouth and from our mind and begin to speak. We are children of the Most High God. Lord, your word says in Ephesians 3, you have adopted us into the kingdom. You have called us your very own sons and daughters. Let us rise up, Lord, not only to sit at the king's table vicariously as we live our life, but also, Lord, help us to remember those. If Rhonda Davis or anyone else listening today is at a place of victory and freedom, 
and are, is not remembering those that are still living in Lodabar. Awaken us with grace. Don't let us presume how it looks. Let us just be Jesus with skin on. And most of all, let the yes be on our face and the yes in our heart. Let us be the ones they want to talk to, Lord, that we may fill this house with the lost. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church said, Amen. Give him one more praise before we pray. Before we close, I just want you to get someone's hand or go to someone and just that you know. If, if you don't know someone, please don't feel uncomfortable. But I want you to pray over them. I want you to pray over their position and their influence. I want you to pray over them like they are a King David, that they will obediently call others in. Would you do that right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for this hand that I'm holding or I pray for myself. Lord, I acknowledge today that every person in this room has influence and position. Lord, don't let them by the lies of the devil that they're in Lodabar because of where they work or what they do or be looked down on any point. Lord, let them accept today you have given them position and an influence. It's not the right words. It's the right heart. It's not the right theology. It's open arms to grace. Lord, I pray that you would commission each one of us as ambassadors of Jesus Christ that we would begin to use the influence you've given us. We would stop looking for big doors and open through the doors right before us. Use us as a church body, Lord. Let another influx of addicts and those that are hurting and the wounded ministers come in, Lord. Raise up new ministries in this house. Raise up and do even greater things than we've seen before. Let them come, Lord, and let them be raised up that the King's table of Jesus Christ at Church of the Harvest would be full. We call it done in the name of Jesus and everyone said Amen. One more praise to him for as we're done. One more praise to him. Hallelujah to the king. Anybody thankful for grace today? Anybody thankful for the king's table? For the sake of Jesus, God has accepted me.